Uh, we must now move on to questions to the Minister of the Environment. Can I tell members that questions 4, 10 and 15 have been withdrawn? I call Mr Sammy Douglas. Mr Douglas. Question number one, please. In December 2009, DOE published the 2009-15 North Eastern River Basin Management Plan. This plan identifies where the water environment needs to be protected or improved, the time frame to make these improvements and how that can be achieved. As the first 2009-15 cycle is now drawing to a close, a second cycle North Eastern River Basin Management Plan will be published in December this year, and the draft plan is available on the DOE website. The plan is implemented at a local level through a lagging local management area action plan which covers the Conswater, Knock and Loop rivers. The Conswater, Knock and Loop rivers are contained within Conswater River water body which has been modified due to extensive flood risk management. The water quality is classified as poor and the objective is to improve it to moderate by 2021. The Belfast and Lagan Catchment Stakeholder Group provides a public forum for stakeholders, such as the East Belfast Partnership, to discuss water management issues and work in partnership with government agencies to address them. My officials have been actively involved with the Partnership, Rivers Agency and Belfast City Council on improvements in the Victoria and Orangefield Parks and the Knock River. For example, realignment of the river channel, introducing natural meanders, bank projection and marginal planting to help improve water quality. My department is also working with Rivers Agency to help ensure that the Conswater Community Greenway Flood Alleviation Scheme delivers maximum benefits to water quality. I am pleased that through my department's challenge fund and support, the Conswater Community Greenway team and Field Studies Centre work have been able to develop outdoor, outdoor classroom materials for schools and community groups to access. Mr Douglas for supplementary. Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker and I thank the Minister for his answers to date and also that I would certainly extend a welcome um, to the Conswater Community uh, Greenway. I know he tried to do it before but there was uh, bad weather. Um, could I ask the Minister does he have any other um, measures planned to improve the water quality of those three rivers that he outlined? Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank uh, Mr Douglas for the question. And supplementary, he is quite right. I had intended to visit Mrs Wendy Langham, the programme manager of the East Belfast Partnership, last month, but the visit was cancelled due to snow, I believe. However, I will endeavour to get back out there as soon as it warms up a bit. As regards the other measures that we have planned to improve water quality, my officials will continue to support the local communities by following up on and investigating pollution problems in the area. My officials have been and will continue to liaise with the East Belfast Partnership to include the pollution hotline number on interpretive signage in the area. River catchment investigations will continue to be carried out by my officials to monitor the impact of agricultural practices and industrial discharges as well. Information leaflets have been distributed at events in East Belfast to help householders improve the water quality in their own area as well. Well, Mr. Jim Allister for a question. Question two. My department determines planning applications for all renewable energy developments on a case-by-case -case basis against the provisions of Planning Policy Statement 18, Renewable Energy, its supplementary best practice guidance and all other material considerations. PPS 18 provides for the evaluation of all development that seeks to harness energy from renewables, including energy derived from solar energy. It aims to facilitate the siting of renewable energy generating facilities in appropriate locations within the built and natural environment. The best practice guidance to PPS 18 also provides background information and guidance on both active and thermal solar technology. I am aware of the benefits of solar energy. The sun is a natural energy source that does not require the burning of fossil fuels and the associated air emissions. The energy produced from the sun does not deplete any natural resources, and it is therefore considered environmentally friendly. Active solar photovoltaic technology can generate electricity from daylight and can be freestanding, roof-mounted, 
or used as a building material in its own right. My department's policy and guidance ensures that while the wider environmental, economic and social benefits of renewable energy developments will be given significant weight in determining whether planning permission should be granted, the environmental, landscape, visual and amenity impacts associated with such developments are also issues that need to be assessed. I am aware that the issue of large-scale solar energy development is a matter of growing concern and it is my intention to ensure that the final SPPS provides an appropriate level of strategic direction in relation to solar energy development. I have also recently instructed officials to prepare practice notes for planning staff in relation to the handling of renewable energy proposals, including wind and solar developments, which will greatly assist in dealing with these proposals. Mr. Alistair, for supplementary. Does the Minister therefore accept that PPS 18 is not fit for purpose when it comes to dealing with large scale solar farm applications, such as the intended 250 acre application at Kells? And in light of that, and the fact that he speaks of the need for further guidance, would it not be appropriate now to impose a moratorium on considering such applications until adequate policy is in place? Uh, thank the member for the question and the supplementary. Uh, the application to which he refers is, to my knowledge, not yet an application. There, we have, however, received indications of a forthcoming application, and when it does arrive, or if it does arrive, it will be assessed by my department using PPS 18 or its successor in the SPPS. My department is currently finalising the strategic planning policy statement for Northern Ireland, which seeks to, to shape clear and concise planning policy, setting out the purpose of planning and core principles for the new two-tier reformed planning system. As I said in my uh, initial answer, the matter of large-scale solar energy is a matter of growing concern, and I do intend to provide an appropriate level of strategic direction for solar energy in the final SPPS and hopefully that will be published within the next six weeks. It remains my intention to finalise that SPPS, like I say, in, in the very near future. And as I have also previously indicated, I have also instructed officials to prepare practice notes for planning staff in relation to the handling of solar energy proposals. And Mr. Patsy McGloon. Um, just in regard to the Minister's review and production of the SPPS, um, can he give us any indication as to the time frame for that, and also if uh, measures are going to be built into it around renewables and the context of how policy may apply in protected areas or areas of outstanding natural beauty? Well, uh, as already outlined, it is my intention to finalise the SPPS prior to the transfer of functions in April uh, th this year. We have most of the work done. There are still bits of it that need tweaked, or in my opinion, improved. And uh, one of those areas is in and around PPS 18. Uh, of course, the issues that the member raises around sensitive and special landscapes is one that my department does take very seriously. And uh, that will be reflected in the final SPPS and how we, deal, how we deal with current applications on renewable energy and how we deal with and how councils will be expected to deal with renewable energy applications in the future. Call Mrs. Anna Lou. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, as the Minister knows, uh, most of renewable energy uh, comes from wind turbines. Um, can I ask the Minister what measures is he taking to encourage alternative sources that, that to, to encourage a mix of different energy uh, renewable uh, potentials? Uh, I thank uh, the Chair of the Committee for her question. She is quite right to identify that the majority of our renewable energy does come from wind. Currently, of the energy produced in Northern Ireland, 19.6% of it actually comes from renewable sources, and the vast majority of that is uh, from wind. As regards what I am doing as Minister for the Environment to encourage alternative sources, I believe that I can do so in, in terms of 
planning policy and guidance. And while we do encourage and all, I believe, should embrace renewable technology, it's vitally important that in planning policy statements and, and in guidance issued by myself and by my officials that we do protect the natural environment as well as recognising the wider uh, environmental and economic benefits of re renewable energy. Incentives are offered by another department uh, for various renewable energy initiatives and uh, those questions as to exactly how that's done would probably be better directed towards uh, Minister Foster. Mr. Dathy McCarthy. I'd ask an employer, and I, I speak as a supporter of solar uh, energy, uh, but there is a remarkable lack of regulation currently in place uh, for these applications. Uh, there is applications in the system uh, for resharking. There's forthcoming uh, application for kales as well. Can the minister uh, give an assurance that they will not be considered under PPS 18 uh, alone? Uh, and will the views of the residents in those areas uh, be fed into the publications that you'll put out in the next six weeks? Well, I'd like to think that the views of residents and objectors and stakeholders right across the North have been factored in to the SPPS already. It was subject to extensive consultation and attracted over 700 responses. Uh, the, the applications to which the member refers are, are one is an application that the other has, is an application yet to arrive. And I know uh, the member had sought a meeting with me on that particular project which I wasn't able to grant, given that there is no existing application. However, if one does come in, I'd be more than happy to meet the member and, indeed, the local people whose concerns he believes should be taken on board, as well as uh, visual and amenity impact and uh, landscape issues. The views of objectors and, indeed, supporters are all material considerations when it comes to dealing with any planning application and planning applications for renewable energy are no different in that regard. To Paul Free. Mr. Deputy Speaker, and as someone who sees the potential in solar uh, farms, particularly uh, in, a, in an industrial scale, uh, is the Minister uh, assured that there is the expertise within his department and the planning service to deal with these applications? And is he, can he tell this House that there will be specific measures within the new SPPS on proximity to homes uh, and a measurement for that? And also, has he done any calculations on what large-scale uh, uh, solar farms will mean to the, the actual bills that our industry has to pay? I thank the member uh, for his questions and welcome his uh, support for solar energy. The issues which he raises, such as separation uh, distances and so forth, will obviously be incorporated, as they are currently for wind energy. Different people in this chamber and outside of this chamber have different views as to whether the separation distances currently enshrined in, in that policy are sufficient. However, again, the SPPS has, has given us an opportunity to review those, and we, you may wait and see the outcome of those deliberations within the next six weeks. Uh, I'm hopeful that my answers on this subject have shed some light on, on this issue, and again, I look forward to discussing it further upon the publication of the SPPS. I will take on board uh, issues raised by the members today in the finalisation of that document. Ms. Michaela Boyle for a question. Question three. Question three. A series of training events were rolled out across councils from early September 2014 to late January 2015. The sessions covered an overview of planning for councillors, development plans and working with the community, practical planning and propriety and outcomes or the code of conduct. The training was facilitated and delivered by senior planning staff, staff from other departments and outside bodies, for example the Northern Ireland Housing Executive and representatives from other jurisdictions with knowledge and experience of similar planning systems. The training programme was developed to help prepare those attending to understand the new planning system, the processes involved in making planning decisions, and the need to comply with ethical standards. At a local level, the department continues to work closely 
with the new councils to provide training and guidance through, for example, working with the shadow planning committees or facilitating mock planning committee meetings, which planning staff and councillors have attended. The area planning managers are also taking responsibility for preparing, training and educating their staff for the change. Ongoing training for planners on the new two-tier planning system will continue to be delivered over the coming months to ensure that all involved in the new system have the necessary skills and competence to ensure the system is delivered effectively from day one. Locally, each new council has developed a training plan and has been allocated £100,000 to meet needs identified in their plan. This will provide training to cover new councillor induction and governance arrangements, as well as organisational design. As well as the training given by councils and planning headquarters, regional training continues, covering areas such as community planning via a contract with community places and the new councillor code of conduct. Funding has also supported community planning workshops for all stakeholders involved in the process. Added to this, funding has been made available for developing a communication strategy in preparation for the transfer. Congress Boyle for supplement. Can I thank the Minister for his answer? And can the Minister outline how councillors uh, are being trained and skilled to specifically address issues um, of flexibility which may or will affect uh, rural councillors, which will apply to rural councils uh, when adjudicating on applications from non farming dwellers? Gormogut. Uh, I th thank the, the member for the question and the, the supplementary. Obviously, uh, the needs in different council areas and for different councillors will be different. However, to this stage, the training has focused on the core ethics of planning and the basic knowledge that, that councillors, and particularly those on the planning committees, will require to discharge their new uh, re responsibility. I am very aware of the issue that Ms Boyle raises. I noticed Mr McAldoff sat beside her and I'm sure he probably gave her a, a kick to ask around non-farming dwellers and indeed flexibility will be afforded to councils in the formation and formulation of their new local development plans that they can uh, reflect that, those very specific local needs in those final plans. Mr. Gregory Campbell for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, how confident is the Minister that the level of maturity exists within the local councils to reach planning decisions that will affect the entire community? I ask that given the level of immaturity that has been displayed in some councils in trying to arrive at the name of the council, in particularly thinking of the nationalist councillors that seem to 100% oppose unionism in terms of London, Derry and Strabane and one or two other councils as well? It's, uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I, I very much welcome a, a question on immaturity from an expert on it. I'm, extreme, I, I'm extremely uh, I'm confident that, that through uh, the guidance issued by my department, through the, the on, through the ongoing uh, training, and it is indeed training that I'm sure the councils will be willing to continue after the transfer of function, and through the establishment and adherence to the code of conduct, the councillors will adhere to that, and the councillors will make their planning judgment based based on planning policy, based on planning guidance, and should they not, they will be leaving themselves open to legal challenge. I do anticipate that the transition will not be easy, having uh, recently an offer will made the transition from someone who was used to lobbying on planning issues to someone who now has to make planning decisions. I do recognise that, that, that there is a huge degree of growing up that is required. Mr. Danny thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. And I thank the Minister for his answer so far. But I imagine the Minister isn't satisfied with how all the training is going, because the comments we're getting from councillors, are that they're, particularly from DETI and DSD, when it's them that's being concerned, that actually little powers are being transferred because there's little contact happening between those departments and the councillors. Will the Minister work with the other executive colleagues to make sure that more training does happen and that really it is all um, up to scratch. 
thank the member for the question, which is a, a very pertinent one. A lot of focus has been on planning as a transferring function, but there are other functions that are transferring as well. Last week, I chaired the second meeting of the partnership panel, which allows for political discussion between uh, elected members of the 11 new councils and executive ministers. And they had and will continue to have a lot of questions around some of the other transferring functions, one of which is the, the transfer of off-street car parking. Uh, and, and, and a lot of these instances, the, the councils aren't overly enamoured with the degree of funding coming along with that function. However, I can state from a DOE perspective that I have ring-fenced the planning budget uh, to transfer with that function, so it hasn't been subject to the cuts imposed throughout the year in, in, in various uh, monitoring rounds and uh, various budgetary cuts, and that has actually had a detriment on the rest of, of my uh, departmental spend. Uh, DRD are transferring, DRD are transferring a very important function in, in terms of local economic development and tourism. And yes, indeed, I believe that the councillors do require further training in this field as well. However, the best training anyone can get for any job is actually doing it. And I have every confidence that what the councillors don't know on the 1st of April, they won't be long finding out. Mr. Tom Elliott for a question. Uh, question number five, Deputy Speaker. As members will be aware, my predecessor secured a commitment from the executive of £30 million for a rates convergence scheme specifically to alleviate the impact on those ratepayers who would have experienced a sudden increase in their rates as a result of the formation of the 11 new councils. In addition, my officials have been working very closely with colleagues in both DFP and local government to ensure that the immediate impact on ratepayers as a result of reform will be minimised. Last November, the Minister of Finance and Personnel announced the details of the scheme, which will provide direct support to both domestic and non-domestic ratepayers who would otherwise have faced sudden and excessive increases in their rate bills because of the differences that currently exist between the rates set by the existing councils. It will be phased over the next four-year term of the councils with an 80% reduction on the increased portion of the next year's bills, followed by subsidies of 60%, 40% and 20% in the remaining years of the scheme. Upwards of 200,000 ratepayers will benefit with discounts automatically applied. Well, Mr. Elliott, for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the, the Minister for that update. Has the Minister got any uh, recent information or received an update of the difference between the Fermanagh and Oma councils? And if so, does he have any idea how much finance will be going into that area out of that £30 million in this particular year? Wonder, did the member wonder had uh, any further information since he last asked me this during my last uh, question time? The rates convergence scheme will address only the increase in rates bills, which is a direct result of the creation of the new larger councils. Over the years, differences have built up in the level of district rates chargeable by both Fermanagh and Oma district councils. The level of district rates chargeable by Oma district council has, as the member is well aware, been higher and for Mana District Council. By the use of the funding increments as I've outlined of 80%, 60%, 40% and 20% over the next four financial years, the rates convergence scheme it is expected will benefit 30,000 for Mana rate payers whose bills may experience a slight increase as a result of merging with OMA Council. And in real terms, that will translate to a discount of about 40 or 50 pounds off their rate bills. Mr. Phil Flanagan. I thank the, the Minister for his answers. Um, can you give us an indication as to when ratepayers in Fermanagh will, will know the, the final rates bill they have to pay, given that the district rate hasn't been set yet, the executive hasn't set its regional rate, um, and then ratepayers will have to wait for this convergent fund to be rolled out? So does, he, does he have any indicative time as to when people will know exactly how much they're going to pay? I, I thank uh, the member for that question. I'm not sure when it is the Council's intention to strike their uh, rate. However, I, know I do know that I have furnished them 
with any information that I can to allow them uh, to, to do so before the 15th of February deadline that is statutorily imposed on all councils and expected from all councils. I have therefore told them what they will be getting from my department by way of rate support grant. It is regrettable that that has had to be cut by 15.1 per cent this year. And again, that is an issue that was raised uh, by quite a few uh, council, council representatives on the partnership panel. As regards the actual striking of the regional rate, that is uh, clearly an issue for the Minister for Finance and, and Personnel, but I do think that it is vitally important that we do move quickly so that people can have that certainty as early as possible. Mr. Alban McGinn. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the ministers for his answers. Uh, could I ask the minister, uh, in relation to the impact of rates convergence and reductions in rate support for the Derry City Council and Straban uh, City Council, um, could the minister uh, indicate the impact of that, uh, given the brutal reduction uh, in funding to the Department of the Environment? I uh, thank the, the member for that question. I, I recently and indeed regularly meet with representatives of that immaturely named council. <laughs> and, and at my most recent meeting with them, they raised with me the, the issue of the impact of the revaluation of non-domestic properties on both rates convergence and the level of rate support grant that will be payable to Derry and Straban in the next financial year. Subsequently, at my request, the Council sent me a detailed case study setting out the specific details. There is a, a, a real anomaly in that area due to the rates revaluation that has seen a, a huge hike in uh, Straban non-residential rates. This matter was also raised with the Finance Minister at the Partnership Panel <coughs> meeting last week, and I believe he is meeting a deputation from that Council this afternoon. As the matter of revaluation of non-domestic properties and rates convergence are rating policy issues, I have written to the Finance Minister asking him to consider the details raised by the Council. I have indicated to the Finance Minister that I would be receptive to any constructive proposals that he may have to resolve this matter. In relation to rate support grant, given the financial uh, pressures that my department is facing, and I know the member is well aware of them as an environment member committee, including a pressure of an estimated £3 million in payment of the derating grant, it has not been possible to uh, protect the, derating, or sorry, the rate support grant from cuts. Therefore, the budget for rate support has been reduced to £15.5 million this year. In real terms for Derry and Straban, that means they will be getting just over £3 million, but it is a reduction of, almost, or of over half a million pounds from what they were getting last year. Call Mrs. Judith Cochran for a question. Question six, please. My department has lead responsibility, working with our road safety partners, including DRD and the PSNI, for Northern Ireland's road safety strategy to 2020. Action measures in the strategy with regard to motorcycle safety include establishing a motorcycle safety forum comprising representatives of relevant public sector organisations and groups representing motorcyclists, researching the issue of conspicuity and visibility of motorcyclists, improvements to training and awareness techniques, and consideration of technology to help improve safety. I can report that my department has convened the Motorcycle Safety Forum, which is now working on the development of a motorcycling safety strategy. I am confident that working together with other statutory agencies and the motorcycling groups, we can make significant progress to address this important road safety issue. Action measures relevant to motorcycle safety, which have already been implemented, include compulsory basic training for new riders. Staged testing for new motorcycle riders dependent on their age was also implemented as part of the third EU directive on driver licences. My department is acutely aware of the rise in motorcyclist fatalities in recent years. There were four motorcyclist deaths in 2012, the lowest figure on record. Since then, there has been an increase, with 10 motorcyclists killed 
and 2013, rising to 13 riders and 1 pillion passenger last year. In light of this increase, I commissioned a statistical review to determine early areas of intervention to address casualty levels. In addition, my department commissioned research to support decisions on early interventions to improve motorcycle safety. A range of possible interventions was explored. The outcome of the research was that campaign advertising as an early intervention was the best way to address the issue. I have therefore commissioned a new motorcyclist safety campaign. I'm afraid, Mrs Cochran, we don't have time for a supplementary. We need to move on to topical questions. And I call Mr. Chris Hazard. Mr. Hazard. Last can, call you. can I ask the Minister to outline why all the beaches on the North Down coastline have been granted EU bathing status, but only one out of dozens of beaches on the Lakeel coastline in South Down have been granted such status? Minister. I, I, I thank the, the mm. member for his question. We are blessed here across the North to have so many beautiful beaches, and I think it is incumbent upon all of us to do what we can. A, to keep them beautiful and, in many other cases, make them more beautiful. As regards the, the designation uh, to which the, the member refers, I am I, I, I'm not sure as to why that is the case. I'm personally familiar with the beautiful beaches of the member's constituency and will ascertain to establish the rationale behind uh, those designations and why more awards haven't been made in the, the South Down area, and I'm happy to meet the member at a later date or a sooner date to discuss that with the relevant officials. Call Mr. Hazard for a supplement. Call Mr. Last can call you indeed. I thank the response from the minister. Well, <clears throat> one of the one of the reasons, of course, why bathing status hasn't been granted is uh, the unacceptable situation that we still have raw sewage being pumped into uh, some of the waters, especially around Ballyhornan. But I think it's an indictment upon the Department of Environment that in 2015, for such a, a tourism-heavy area as South Down, that only one of the beaches in the Lakeel coastline out of dozens have that EU status. And I would like to see a project of work from the Department of Environment to, to bring this uh, subject forward. Would the Minister be willing to do this? I thank the member for that supplementary, and certainly I would be prepared to do anything, as I say, to improve the standard of beaches and bathing waters, not only in the South Down area, but right across the North. <coughs> I am indeed aware of the issues regarding the water quality to which the member refers, and my department has been working on this issue. We have been working with many other partners, not least. DRD or Northern Ireland Water, who have uh, quite a bit to answer for as regards uh, the, the water quality or lack thereof in some of the areas to which the member referred. Call Mr. Fran McCann for a topical question. May, may, may I get Karja, uh, Deputy Speaker? Uh, can I ask the Minister uh, to outline any extent of any discussions between his department and the Department of Social Development uh, regarding the need for sown and additional land? And the West Belfast for social housing. I thank the member for uh, his question. And having sat on the social development committee with the member for a couple of years, I'm sure he will be aware that I share his his passion for uh, social housing provision. Uh, the planning system, as the member is rightly aware, does not deliver social housing. This is largely a matter for DSD the housing executive, the various housing associations and others, but the planning system can assist by allocating land for social housing and development plans and by taking decisions and planning applications having regard to existing planning policies, such as planning policy statement 12, housing and set settlements. Uh, the member has raised before the fact that he would like to have seen in BMAP, for example, more land zoned for social housing. Uh, at that time, I, I, I referred to the fact that just because land is, isn't specifically zoned for social housing but is zoned for general housing does not mean that it can't be used or won't ultimately be used uh, for social housing. And if an application for social housing is to come forward on any of those zo zoned areas, it would be treated just the same as, as an application for general housing on those areas. It is our belief that within BMAP uh, there is sufficient zoning uh, for social housing, albeit that I am well aware 
of the demand for social housing, not least in the member's own constituency, as it's, it's a demand that's shared by my own constituency as well. Mr. McCann, for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Minister, for uh, uh, his response. Um, he, he will know that in my constituency, uh, that has the worst housing waiting list. There's over 3,000 people waiting on houses, all hostels, and around the general Belfast area. It's packed with people from that constituency. That has the highest number of pensioners who are waiting on houses, the highest number of young people who are waiting on houses, but it's continuously squeezed uh, by the lack of land. And I think it's urgent. Uh, that the, 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 the Minister and the Minister for Social Development sit down and look at ways the member that, come to question? that the, the more law uh, be brought into use uh, within that constituency. You know, the movement of the Matthew Stapp Lane, which was drew up 30 years ago, no longer exists. And I would ask the Minister to take that into consider, uh, under consideration and move towards doing something about it. Again, I thank the member for the, the supplementary. However, I am well aware of the demand for social housing and the needs of those who require uh, social housing as well. The, the, minister, or the, sorry, the member referred to the need for more land to be zoned in order to address this problem. However, given that there is, again, as I say, in the Department's opinion, sufficient land currently zoned, we would very much welcome and love to see further applications come forward for that land that is already zoned. Given the, the huge demand and need in the member's own area, I am sure he would be pleased to know that just this morning I issued an approval for a social housing scheme on the Glen Road uh, in West Belfast that has been held up due to technical difficulties within the planning system. Call Mr Stephen Mutry. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister outline what efforts his department has made to promote the Places of Worship Roof Repair Fund, uh, a grant scheme administered by the National Heritage Memorial Fund on behalf of the Department of Culture, Media and Sport at Westminster? Uh, I thank the, the member uh, for that question. Uh, I, I was delighted to be made aware of this fund uh, that has been run through the HLF, uh, uh, and I actually asked or directed that the press release go out from me as Environment Minister encouraging people to take it up and at least make them aware that this did exist, particularly given the constraints on my own budget and the fact that I have been able in the last few months to do so little as regards built heritage and its preservation, protection and promotion. I uh, very much value all our built heritage and we are blessed if you uh, pardon the, the terminology, to have so many places of worship that, that, that tick those heritage boxes as well. Again, if the member feels that we could or should be doing more to promote uh, this scheme and encourage more applicants, I would be happy to hear from him how he suggests we, we should do it. Mr. Butry for a supplementary. Thank you, uh, and I thank the minister for his response. And I appreciate that he has to date sent uh, a press release out encouraging places of worship to avail of this fund. But can I ask, through his department, that he looks at ways to be more proactive so that churches can avail of this, especially as many churches don't want to directly take from the lottery fund? Uh, uh, certainly, I will explore what options are, are open to me and my department in order to maximise drawdown uh, from this fund. I alluded to already the constraints on my own budget in terms of what we can do as regarding built heritage. So I see this grant, if you like, very much as an opportunity to, to supplement what we are doing, what we are trying to do, and what we want to do. But if the, the member has any specific churches in mind, again, I would be delighted or happy to meet with them and see what we can facilitate, even if it can go through my department and then to the church or churches in question. Paul, Mrs. Karen McKevitt for a topical question. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister, in light of the budget constraints, uh, can he outline how his department will work to maintain and develop the heritage tour tourism potential of the Narrowwater um, Cape and also Dundrum Castle? I uh, uh, thank the member for her question. Narrow Water Keep and the Dundrum Castle are two of over 190 monuments in state care managed by the NIEA 
on behalf of my department. My department has spent over £45,000 on the maintenance of the historic fabric of Narrow Water Keep since 2012, and I am committed to improving the presentation of the structure for its many visitors. This is not going to be easy, as that particular building suffers from water ingress, possibly as a result of bomb damage in the past. My officials are investigating this issue and have been trialling solutions. The NIEA craft workforce plan to undertake a comprehensive grouting regime to the core of the walls should the trials prove that this is required. It will be challenged to retain the opening of both these uh, buildings and indeed other sites in the area as it is, is challenging at present. NIA officers met with local councillors and council officials from Newry and Mourne District Council in December to discuss the opening of Narrow Water Keep in particular. The meeting considered the potential for working in partnership to open the site. My officials are continuing this positive dialogue with the aim of a proactive arrangement for opening and improved access in 2015 and beyond. Call Mr. McKevitt for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister will he give his commitment to engage with the local stakeholders and the Council on this? Well, I, I believe that local engagement is vital, and uh, to that effect, I have instructed my officials to explore new and different ways to develop increased access opportunities at all of our heritage sites. I believe, as I said, that local engagement is the key to the partnerships we require for the future at sites like Narra Water keep like Dundrum Castle and like so many other uh, sites across the north. Officials are keen to work with local stakeholders and community groups and to enlist support from local authorities in particular. Current partnerships with other local authorities such as Derry, Fermanagh and Cookstown exemplify how positive and beneficial for the local heritage this can be. I have asked the agency to progress with urgency the positive steps that it has begun with Nuri and Morn to deliver a secure and sustainable future for Nara Water Keep and other sites in the area to increase its contribution to the area's heritage tourism potential. Call Mr. Pat Ramsey for a topical question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister and would he acknowledge me the most effective mechanism within his department to ensure that we have a good message on road safety going out is uh, the TB adverse, most dramatic that does have an effect. Could the Minister outline to the House the effect that the budget is going to have on him and what other creative ways is he going to do to get that message on road safety out? I thank uh, the, the member for his question and I am aware of the member's own keen interest in uh, road safety. Indeed, I, I know he intends to or we will be debating next week the members' own private members' bill on 20 mile per hour speed limits in residential areas. The member quite rightly identifies the effectiveness of television advertising in terms of promoting road safety and driving down the number of collisions that result in fatalities and serious injuries on our roads. However, it is with great regret that due to budgetary constraints, the amount that we will be able to spend on that will be dramatically reduced this year. Last year, £1.8 million was spent on television advertising. I have to say that all the evidence is there that television, television advertising has proved to be very effective and has a huge impact on the viewer. However, this year, <laughs> my discretionary spend across the department is somewhere in the region of £1.5 million, which is less than we actually spent on road safety advertising last year. Therefore, it is imperative that we do look at more creative ways of spending that money. I certainly will not be foregoing the television route altogether, but it is important, I suppose, that we are again more creative with how we use that money. and We support television advertising or continue to support it with perhaps enhanced uh, education programmes with a, a better use of social media and enhanced work with our road safety partners, both in other statutory <coughs> agencies and, and the PSNI, and also in the voluntary and community sector, where we do have very good working relationships with the likes of the GAA and the Ulster Farmers Union. 
Could I call Mr Ramsey for a very quick supplementary question? Given we certainly this year there has been a, a low level of deaths on our roads, what other efforts is it your own department making to try and reduce speed in residential areas and, and in city centres where there is fatalities and serious injuries? Well, uh, l last year I actually saw an increase in road deaths. Fortunately, uh, although it's very early this year, uh, the, the awful start that we had to last year hasn't been mirrored. However, from the fatalities last year, we can see that speed remains the biggest single causation factor of fatalities on our roads, and therefore it is often at the centre of our advertising and information campaigns, reminding people of the need to kill their speed before they kill someone. Thank you. Order. Time is up.